Welcome to History Tea Time Chat Live. It's Wednesday, 23rd of August. I hope you're very well. Today, I want to talk to you. It's inspired by a recent trip I, I have done and what I'm about to do. I want to tell you about the history of Westminster and Whitehall because, um, well, it's the centre of power in in England and therefore Britain and at times when there was the empire also the centre so why why is it actually where it is cited I think you'll find that interesting so that's what I'm going to cover with you today um I am streaming live on Instagram Facebook and YouTube thank you so much for joining me live um and yeah, let's get on. So you can, of course, thank you. Uh, Emma's loving that. Yes, of course, we're at a different time. We're at 3 p.m. This is a time trial. So we'll see if this suits more people. I did have a little bit of a go um, at this a few weeks ago. So um, and if if people prefer the 3 p.m. time slot, then that is what we will stick with. Hello, Brian, down there in a hot and sunny Cornwall. Good. About time. Tudor's reimagined. Hello in the U.S. How are you doing? Um, so yeah, so you can support me as always with badges on Instagram, stars on Facebook, um, super chats on YouTube, but the way I would really like you to support me because it's the way I can give the most back is to sign up to my Patreon. It's patreon.com forward slash British history. And the reason that I like to do that is because I can give you exclusive blogs. I can give you access to historians so you can ask your own questions. We have book club, of course, book club. The next book that we are, well, the one that we're on at the moment is Houses of Power by Simon Thurley. Um, and uh, we are meeting on the 17th of September. It's all by Zoom. So it doesn't matter where you are in the world, you can join in. Um, what else do we have? Exclusive behind the scenes and uh, early access to tour tickets and I've got an exciting one to tell you about at the moment. Linda is in uh, Michigan, 10 a.m. Oh, that sounds that sounds a, a decent time. Bassiendia, thank you so much for the badge on Instagram. Thank you for supporting me. Um, Mayfair Forest, which is in oh, Dorothy, let's do your full, full handle, a hot and humid Poland. <laughs> I'm dying. <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> it's uh I like the heat although I'm here in a polar neck it's the middle of or well, near end of August and I'm in a polar neck for goodness sake this is not what it's supposed to be um yes Brian we do have history after dark tonight I will tell everyone in a little while actually uh, who we will be discussing please feel free to prompt me if I forget I'm noticing how much how much how bobbly my jumper is someone needs to go at me with some sellotape um so let's start talking some history first of all I have some thank yous um Susie and Caroline have both joined my Patreon um this week um so they will be um taking advantage of now uh getting oh actually right this week um the interviews that I've been going on about for a long time, the series on the dissolution of the monasteries that started on Monday in Patreon and it will go through till um, exclusively through till Saturday where they get a bonus episode and then that will go out on general release next week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So there's five episodes and it is fab and you can binge watch them all in one go or you can watch them daily however you take your box sets. Um, I have catered for you. So, yeah, I know, Brian, I need a brush or a something. I'm going to keep picking the hairs off it. Mm. Um, okay, so, yes, before I talk to you about the history of Westminster and Whitehall, which I hope you'll find interesting, like I say, it's inspired by a visit I did down to Westminster um, with... Uh, you might know him, Dr. Will Cole. He's he's written a book, his most recent book called Gut Feelings. Um, um, and uh, and he was over with his family. So I had the privilege of taking them around Westminster. And, uh, and we also went over to the City of London, to the Tower of London as well. And so I am fresh from... <laughs> brushing up on my history of Westminster and Whitehall, which I've always found interesting because why is the centre of English and then British power centred there? 
it's just interesting. So I will take you through that. But before I do that, one of the things, um, oh, Colleen says this time is good. Fabulous. Okay. Um, I'm going to try and keep an eye on, on comments. So if I do miss yours, please feel free to put it in again, especially on Instagram where I can't see them once they go off the screen. Um, <laughs> Dorothy, black clothes and a camera means, yeah, every tiny speck is visible from space. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> oh, I just feel bad, you know. Um, right, where was I? Yes, so... In Patreon at the moment, if you are a Shakespeare fan, if you're a Dr. Cat Marchant fan, if you're a History After Dark fan and you would like to do a weekend, um, I'm running it as British History Tours. Um, Cat is the tour historian and Catherine will be there. So it's a, um, it's a British History Tours had merge. <laughs> and we're looking at Shakespeare in Stratford. So we're basing ourselves in Stratford-upon-Avon for the weekend of the 28th till the 30th of June. Uh, and it will, uh, we stay in a beautiful hotel called the Arden, right next to the Royal Shakespeare Company Theatre, which is right next to the river um, uh, Avon. I was going to say Arden, that would be wrong because the whole place is called Stratford-on-Avon. Um, and we will be going to a theatre show. Um, we, so a Shakespeare production at the, at the RSC, we will be seeing Shakespeare's birthplace, the place that he went to school, the place where his father was um, town bailiff and um, and he probably came across travelling players as a child or as a, as a youth. We'll also see where he is buried. And during the weekend, Kat is going to be giving us three different talks. Now, if you want to know more, you can visit my website, BritishHistoryTours.com. You can also go to my YouTube channel, which is British History. So you can do YouTube.com forward slash British History. Some of you are already there. Some of you would have to go finding it. And... Um, there's a video on there where we're talking all about it. The bookings are open to patrons, uh, patrons on my Patreon. So someone has just asked um, on Instagram how they join. So if you go to Patreon, which is P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash British history. The link should also be in my bio, which obviously you can um, get hold of after we finish this live uh, and join. It's five pounds a month and you get quite a lot in there. Um, and you also get um, <laughs> a, uh, um, sorry, so it's just, no, I'm not accepting your request to come on my live. Thanks. <laughs> Why are people so odd? Um, so that's that. Also, just as I'm talking about tours, just to mention, there are, um, so obviously that's a new tour that's out. There are a few spaces left for the Anne Boleyn tour, which begins um, on the 30th of April next year. Um, it's our second Anne Boleyn tour because the first one is fully booked. Thank you, Emma. She says, well worth it, the Patreon. Thank you. Um, so, yes, yeah, so we have a few spaces left for... Um, the Amberlin tour that starts um, at the end of April next year. We also have the last few spaces on the rise of the Tudors for next September. So that's September 2024. So if you're interested in either of those, please do have a look on British BritishHistoryTours.com for the full details. Right. So that with that all out of the way, um, let me tell you about the history of Westminster and Whitehall. I'm going to have to assume that you already know where I'm talking about. So this is the site where you have Westminster Abbey, you have Parliament Square, which is quite an open, um, grassy square, literally, with statues around it. Um, and most famously, probably, well, I suppose the Abbey's pretty famous, but the, the Houses of Parliament, which you'll, you'll see on the TV a lot. Big Ben chiming at uh, New Year. So there are Houses of Parliament, which you also might have heard referred to as the Palace of Westminster. I'm going to take you back, first of all, right, right back to the time when the Romans were here 
in in England. Um, so this is uh, up till 410 AD. And the Romans were fabulous. I'm going to a Roman site on Friday, actually. I'm very excited about it. Um, the Romans built a road network and they obviously built towns, etc. Now, the space, the place, sorry, um, where West, the Houses of Parliament and Westminster Abbey now sit, that used to be a land bank on the um, banks of the River Thames. Obviously, it's still on the banks of the River Thames. The River Thames at that point was much, much wider and tidal. It's still tidal, but it's um, controlled by, um, by the Thames barrier. So at low tide, this actually was a crossing point. You could walk over the river, believe it or not. And um, when, um, so, so, so you could cross here, we could cross over onto a place started to be called, or got become known as Thorny Island. And you could then go on your merry way up the Watling Street to take you to the rest of the sort of the country, wherever else you want to go. Or you might hang a right and go round to what would become the city of London, Londinium in Roman times, London Vig uh, after that in Anglo-Saxon times, uh, and obviously becomes the city of London. So it's a very important, um, well, it's a strategic place because it's where people are traveling to, um, through. People are stopping, giving thanks because... I know, because they've, they've they've made a safe journey so far, they've managed to cross. They're about to cross, and they want they want a bit of protection um, from from the powers that be. Um, and so it be, it begins to get sort of a spiritual feeling, a spiritual connotation. And in nine sixty, the Bishop of London, a man called Dunstan, who would later on uh, become a saint. He establishes a Benedictine monastery. So this is 960 AD, way after the Romans have left. But this is established as a crossing place. And um, Edward the Confessor visits this, um, this monastery around about 100 years later. Remember, of course, he's not Edward the Confessor at that point, but we have so many King Edwards, and he doesn't have a number because he is pre-Norman Conquest, uh, for clarity's sake, I will call him Edward the Confessor for now. So he visits the site and there is a sort of legend that says that he has a spiritual um, visitation um, sort of while he's there. And he decides that he would like the monastic church, um, also known as a, a, or frequently known as a minster, um, to be where he is buried, his mausoleum. So he endows the, this monastery, the Benedictine monastery, with money to have the church rebuilt. And the, the church is rebuilt. It is known as Westminster to differentiate it from the Eastminster, which has already been established. That is St. Paul's Cathedral in the so to the east in the city of London. So this is why it is known as Westminster. It is the minster in the west. Edward also decides to move his court here. From the ancient capital of Winchester, Edward is going to set up court next to the abbey. So he builds a palace. The palace, of course, is called Westminster because it is next to the Westminster. So you get Westminster Palace. Um, Edward almost, almost lives to see his church consecrated. But actually, when it comes to the consecration in, at the end of December uh, 1065, he is too ill to attend. He dies about a week later and is buried in the church. So he, he gets his final wish. He would have seen it pretty much finished, I suppose, Um but unfortunately, he doesn't get to go to the consecration, but he does get to, um, he, he is buried in there. So, so he gets that. Now, a few centuries later, you have Henry III. And um, he, uh, he decides that this ancient king, 
who has since been canonized. So he was canonized in 1161. This is when he becomes Edward, known as Edward the Confessor. So he is, he's been canonized. So Henry the um, third, who is, um, so, so he, he he's actually becomes a big fan of, uh, of Edward the Confessor. He calls his first son Edward. This is highly unusual. Edward is an Anglo-Saxon name. And these are Norman French um, kings, or at least, you know, well, yes, they are. Um, so anyway, um, he calls his ed, ed, eldest son Edward. So he, he holds this saint king in high reverence. And in 1245, Henry III gives the orders to rebuild the abbey or the abbey church. Um, in order to create a shrine. So remember, Edward has himself buried in Westminster. But of course, this is before he's a saint. A saint requires a shrine. It's also very useful to have a shrine if you would like pilgrims, uh, which every abbey would have enjoyed a pilgrim and the money that came with them. So Henry III sets out, sets up to have the, um, the monastic church, the, the, the minster, rebuilt. And that's pretty much the one that we have now, other than um, in the 1700s or 18th century, um, Nicholas Hawksmoor adds the West um, Towers, the ones you'll see the, the picture of when you see the royal family go in and out of the abbey. And, of course, in the um, early 1500s, Henry VII rebuilds the Lady Chapel, and we know it as Henry VII's chapel. But most of the church is Henry III's church. Henry III also does um, more building work at the palace. He actually does a lot of work at the tower as well. Um, so, excuse me a minute. Uh, talking a lot. Um, so, yeah, so we, we basically get the, 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 the palace that we've got now. Um, Henry III's uh, Archbishop of York is a man called Walter de Grey. Now, by this point, you have, of course, the royal court with a, a palace. Now, the palace is key. Palace means the principal residence of the monarch. There should only be one palace. So this is it. The Over the um, Thames on the other side, the Archbishop of Canterbury has set up his house, Lambeth Palace. The bishops can also have palaces. Um, Walter de Grey, uh, Archbishop of York at the time of Henry III, buys a property on King Street. This is a street that has built up going away from the palace um, in the direction of the city of London. It's where Whitehall is now, Whitehall Street, Whitehall Road. It's just called Whitehall. <laughs> um, or we refer to it as Whitehall. Uh, he's Bishop of York. This is known as York Place. It is the London residence of the Archbishops of York. That will become important in a short while. Um, so you have the Abbey, the Palace. You've now got your main Archbishops. Um, you've got you know, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Archbishop of York, and and other other people moving in. Um, so it just from sort of becoming a favored place of a pre-Norman conquest king, um, a penultimate Anglo-Saxon king, uh, it grows to being the, the center of political, uh, legal, because that's, that's, that, that rests in the court as well and, um, ecclesiastical power. You then get other noble, powerful people moving to the area. So the whole area becomes this, this um, powerful um, place with people wanting, well, people either supplying the court or influencing the court, being used by the court, um, you know, so it's every way. Um, so then you get to... Tudor times. So we've got the Palace of Westminster and I want to, to, to skip a little bit forward to Tudor times because this is how Whitehall comes into it. 
Um, in so in the fifteen end of the fifteen twenties, fifteen thirties, Henry VIII is looking for a divorce from Catherine of Aragon, his first wife. He's been married to her for twenty years. They have one surviving daughter. He has convinced himself or being convinced that what has happened is he has angered God because he has married his brother's widow. Catherine of Aragon had been married to his elder brother, Arthur. Um, so Henry is convinced that he needs his marriage. Actually not, well, there's, it, it needs it annulled. He needs, it, you know, it was never correct. It should never have happened. It needs to be wiped, basically. And I think he's probably pretty sure that the Pope will agree that clearly God has been um, angered by it and and he should he should get the annulment. But the Pope doesn't agree to the annulment. Now, his chief minister at the time is also a cardinal. It's Cardinal Thomas Wolsey. He's also Archbishop of York. And he has effectively promised Henry that he can get him his divorce. When that doesn't transpire, when he can't, then he falls from grace pretty quickly. And one of the things that happen is Henry confiscates his property. Now, some of that was sort of given, like Hampton Court Palace, sort of almost given. Um, but Henry confiscates uh, other places, including York Place. York Place isn't actually Thomas Wolsey's property. It is the Archbishop of York's property. So it comes with the job. However, that doesn't actually stop Henry and Henry takes it. It is earmarked clearly for Henry and the, the woman who he wants to marry, Anne Boleyn, to create a new home. Anne can't really stay with Henry. She can't be at court very easily. So she might be in a house close by, but she can't be in court because Catherine of Aragon is still the queen. She still can, um, well, she's still got her own apartments at the main palaces. Um, so it's a bit like going into any sort of relationship. You don't want to go into the home that the, the your partner with their previous partner had. You want a new home. And this is what, so they earmark York Place to um, to get this, this new home. They also start building a satellite house. So the main palaces would also have satellite houses, um, which was uh, St. James's. Now, what I should make mention of is that in, I can't remember if it was 1511 or 1512, there had been a fire at the Palace of Westminster, which had taken, um, which, had, which had made the uh, domestic areas, uh, sort of the, the, the royal lodgings, inhabitable, uninhabitable, excuse me. By this point, though, um, Henry uh, has got Greenwich Palace that his father built, Richmond Palace that his father built, um, so he's not spending a huge amount of time there, but it does remain very important in terms of parliament and administration and ceremonial linked with the Abbey. Um, so Henry and Anne set, up, set about building, well, designing, and they're very hands-on, they're very hands-on, uh, building and designing their new palace. Now, they need to expand out. So what you've had all of these... Um, uh, influential people, rich people, um, buying up the the property uh, in this area. Well, it's compulsory purchased by Henry, um, so that he can expand the palace out. And he has a administrative side, and he has a uh, administrative and um, because that is part and parcel. So the governance is part and parcel of with the personal of the king, the person of the king. You have your privy chamber. This is your chamber, privy chamber council. You literally have the room and the and the body um, uh, of governance with the similar same name. Um, so you have that side of the palace, which is on the riverside, 
And then you have the pleasure side of the palace, which is where his tilt yard was, the um, cockpit, the real tennis uh, court. Um, you have all these um, all these places on the other side. Um, now, there was an act of parliament uh, passed which named the new palace the Palace of Westminster, or Westminster Palace, can't remember which way around, but either way. It was going to be, this was actually, uh, well, it seems to have been the replacement for Westminster Palace. Um, but it was still being used um, for you know, many of the governmental sort of um, uh, processes and, and things. And so colloquially, and I'm, not, I'm still not actually sure what part of it, why this was the case. Colloquially, it became known as Whitehall. So the new palace, although an act of parliament had called it the Palace of Westminster, um, it was it was known as Whitehall to distinguish it from the Palace of Westminster, which was still actually standing. Um, now, Whitehall, therefore, became powerful in terms of the governance and um and so 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 during henry's henry's reign that builds up um and it's to whitehall i think james the first comes etc so as 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 it moves on into the stuart era as well um there's also then lots of changes obviously with the dissolution so in 1540 westminster abbey is actually dissolved now, 1540, it is right at the end of the dissolution. Um, by this point, it is a royal mausoleum. It doesn't just have Edward the Confessor's shrine. It's got, as you'd expect, Henry III's um, tomb there, his son Edward I, uh, his, his son's wife, Eleanor of Castile, is there. Henry V is there. Um, and most notably in terms of the Tudors, Henry VII has rebuilt the Lady Chapel there as the Tudor Mausoleum. He is buried there. So Henry VIII's parents are buried there. Um, and yet, still, the, the palace, uh, sorry, excuse me, the uh, Westminster Abbey as a religious institution is dissolved and created into a cathedral. And the um, House of, uh, I think it was the Commons would meet in the chapter house. So if we forward on a little bit to Edward the Sixth reign, Edward the Sixth reign, um, who, who so that's Henry the Henry the Eighth's son, the chant, chantry chapels, excuse me, were also dissolved. Now I just find this bit very interesting. So this included St Stephen's Chapel within the the. Uh, within Westminster Palace, which was still functioning. It's unclear where Parliament, well, it's unclear to me anyway, where Parliament were um, meeting between 1540 when the Abbey was dissolved and uh, 1548 when it started to meet in the recently deconsecrated St. Stephen's Chapel in Westminster Palace. Now, what I find fascinating about this is the chapel underwent hardly any alterations for the house of commons to sit in it it's house of commons 300 and nearly 350 mps would sit in there in the um in the choir stalls so facing each other the house of uh, so the speaker of the house would sit um where the um the priest had sat on a sort of slightly higher uh, dais 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 how did you say it um and that's how they would meet in um, 18, I always get this wrong, 18, oh, someone Google it for me, 1837, there is a catastrophic, this time, fire at the Palace of Westminster. And it takes everything but the Great Hall and um, a place called the Jewel, the Jewel Tower, which literally, oh, I've got a little story about the Jewel Tower, actually, which... I'll tell you in a minute. 
fits in with yesterday's uh, anniversary of the Battle of Bosworth. Um, there's this catastrophic fire. And the Houses of Parliament are rebuilt into what we see today, following that. Um, the design was uh, by Sir Charles Barry, based on Henry VII's chapel at Westminster Abbey, which looks nothing like the rest of the Abbey, by the way. And it, but it explains why our Houses of Parliament look so um, elaborate. It's because it's based on Henry VII's um, chapel, which is elaborate. Uh, they rebuilt the chamber for the House of Commons, and actually it's the same in the House of Lords, with that face-on adversarial layout. And I don't, I, I think when you look at other, um, not that I've studied it incredibly well, but other um, like government houses, um, the European Parliament, for example, um, some of the devolved parliaments, they're in a sort of horseshoe shape. You don't have this face-on adversarial um, physical layout to the, to the House of Commons or to, to, to the House of Representatives, whatever it is where you are. Um, and it's because it's based on St Stephen's Chapel that was used because they couldn't use the Abbey anymore and the chapel became deconsecrated, so they used the space and it was repeated. And that is why we have the setup for the House of Commons and the House of Lords that we do now, which is only about 50 yards, um, according to Simon Thurley's work, away from the original site of St. Stephen's Chapel. So anyway, so that is why. So we have Whitehall, um, which are built up and, and, and the Houses of Parliament, which, was, which is where, which is on the site of Westminster Palace and does incorporate the Great Hall into it. Politicians are running up and down there all day. Um, now, Whitehall burnt down in the um, at the end of the Stuart era. I'm trying to think who was on the throne when that when that burnt down. That took almost all of it with it. Then um, the area was um, took quite it took a few hits as well during the Blitz. So everything was rebuilt. Oh, I say everything. Some stuff. Some things did survive. Um, but it always, it it's centered as our um as our center of power. So Whitehall is where our Ministry of Defence is, it's where so it's where the government buildings just got rebuilt there. Um Downing Street had um survived the Blitz. That was established in the um in the reign of George the Third. Uh that's where our Prime Minister lives. Um was there something else I was gonna mention about that? Can't remember. But anyway, so that's what, and that's why it's called Whitehall. So there's, there's, because it's based on Henry VIII's palace that colloquially became known as Whitehall um, to distinguish it from the Palace of Westminster, even though Henry was trying to, um, what well, seems like he was trying to actually uh, create a new Palace of Westminster. Now, the little story about the jewel house at Westminster, the Palace of Westminster. So... If, if if what I've read is is true, is to be believed, when Richard III, our Costa says October 1834, according to Google, was the ha was the fire at the Houses of Parliament. Well, uh, sorry, at Westminster Palace, which then was rebuilt as the Houses of Parliament. I have it written down somewhere, but I don't want to make, bore you by having to wait for uh, for me to find it. <laughs> Thank you, though. Thank you, Costas. Um. August 1485, Richard III goes to his jewel house, I don't know if he went personally, and grabs his everyday crown, because his the really blingy one is in the Tower of London, as always. Uh, but his everyday crown uh, is at the uh is in the jewel house at the Palace of Westminster. So he grabs that ready for the battlefield. He has a helmet specially made, which his crown will fit onto and he goes off to intercept and see off the upstart that is Henry Tudor uh, now as I understand it Henry Tudor wouldn't have referred to himself as Tudor we know that he referred to himself as Henry Richmond his title was the Earl of Richmond which he had inherited at birth because his father had predeceased him, Edmund Tudor, um, 
had been made uh, Earl of Richmond by his half-brother, Henry VI. So when Henry Tudor was born, he was Earl of Richmond and he referred to himself as Richmond. Richard III, though, may well have referred to Henry by his, uh, his Tudor name in a disparaging way because the Tudor name was uh, was the family name of the squire who had managed to marry Catherine of Valois. Catherine of Valois was Henry V's widow. She was only 20 when Henry V died, but she already had a son who was Henry VI. And she remarried. She remarried a squire called Owen Tudor. Oh, it, that's not the full name. It's a full um it's a full Welsh name that I cannot pronounce, um, which is exactly the reason why Tudor was the bit of it that was adopted. It was the bit that everyone else could say. Um, and uh, so Henry, the, uh, yeah, so, um, so Lottie, first thing I heard was Henry VI. You've missed a lot, darling. You are going to have to scrub back in a little while and, and see what the heck I'm talking about. Well, so we're talking about the, uh, I've talked about the history of Westminster and Whitehall and just how it built up in power and why. But I'm just telling now a little story about, oh, Lottie Rose, thank you for the badge. Um, you're very sweet. You've given me a badge every, every life for the last three lives. So thank you so much. Um yeah, I'm telling a little story about Richard III leaving the Palace of Westminster to go and see off Henry Tudor. Um, and that Henry actually would refer to himself as Richmond, which is his title, but Richard III might have referred to him as Henry Tudor because it's it's a disparaging, in a disparaging way, because the name Tudor comes from Owen Tudor, the squire who married Catherine of Valois. Um Catherine of Valois, like I say, was Henry V's widow. Therefore, the children that Catherine had with Owen Tudor were half-siblings to King Henry VI. And the marriage shouldn't have happened, um, but she was the king's mother. So they, the council prudently decided to wait till he was old enough to decide what to do. Anyway, he... Um, his brothers, his half brothers, he he did favour them, and he he bestowed on them titles, lands, income. So Edmund Tudor became Earl of Richmond. His brother Jasper became the Earl of Pembroke, and they could see to because they were Welsh descent as well. They could see to the king's business in Wales. Um, but Edmund Tudor, who married Margaret Beaufort. Um, predeceased, well, so basically died before Henry was born. So Henry, on his birth, inherited the title of Richmond. And that's how he referred to himself as, um, not as Henry Tudor. Like I say, Richard, when Richard would have done that, it's because uh, it's, yeah, seen as a bit of a disparaging thing. So he he'd grabbed his crown from the jewel house at the Palace of Westminster to go and to go and see off this silly boy who'd been in exile for was it fourteen years by that point maybe more actually, um, and uh, of course fully expecting to come back, and he didn't. So Henry the Seventh comes. Excuse me a minute. Um, and this is something I hadn't thought about. This is all, by the way, a lot of this is in the Houses of Power book by Simon Thurley that is in Book Club. Um, it's the current book in Book Club and uh, we'll be discussing it on the 17th of September. So if you want to be in Book Club, join me on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash British History and you can join the Book Club. Um, it's a fabulous book. I'm just wondering if I've got the... Uh, the oh, bah, bah, bah. There you go. I'm 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 uh, putting the ticker tape on um, on Facebook and YouTube. Ali's book is arriving today. Fabulous! You're going to love it. You're going to love it. Um, am I Team Tudor or Team Dicky? I don't <laughs> see. It was the anniversary of the Battle of Bosworth yesterday, wasn't it? Of course. Which so Richard never makes it back to Westminster. Henry gets to Westminster. 
Um, and um, I'll tell you a bit more about that in a minute. And which team am I on? Mm. I should say, I should say Tudor, really. I, I, I need, I, I want to know more about Richard. I can't see the redeeming features in him that others clearly do. Um, he appears to have had a lot of blood on his hands, may well have been literally the one who killed Henry VI in the Tower of London in 1471. He was certainly battle hardy. He may, of course, this is the big disputed one, have been involved, uh, if not given the direct orders for the, um, the doing away with his nephews, Edward the fifth and his younger brother Richard Duke of York and I'm I'm also wondering if he's someone who he was put in such a position he was so loyal to his brother Edward the fourth while he was alive whether he felt that just passing that crown so hard fought for by himself, by the Yorkist faction. He'd lost his father. He'd lost his elder brother, um, Edmund. Then his middle brother um, had uh, defected and been um, Duke of Clarence, uh, George Duke of Clarence, and he'd been executed. So he'd lost his brother. He'd lost his older brother, Edward, Edward um, who was only 41. Um, that was not due to war, but... Um, <laughs> What was he up to? Uh, so I, I, there's a bit of me that's thinking, well, if that is, he's, he, he has literally put his life on the line over and over and over and over again. He's got his hands very dirty if he had been the one carrying out his brother's orders to murder um, or persuade to die of a broken heart, head, uh, Henry VI. Is he going to just sit back and say, cool, yeah, the crown can go to a kid. Is he? Is he? Don't know. So, um, I'm, I'm, I'm still, I'm still out. I think probably, yeah, it's, it's complicated. Remembering, of course, that, you know, a lot of people died deciding on which, which incredibly, privileged rich person is going to rule over them in exactly the same way probably as the other one would have done anyway so um henry the seventh when he comes to london at um so yeah so he comes into london as as king he goes to st paul's um and st paul's precinct is quite large at that time it includes an abbot's lodgings um, and he, um, he goes to the, to St. Paul's Cathedral, um, for a service of thanksgiving. He presents there on the altar, the three standards, um, St. George, the, um, Welsh dragon and the dun cow of Warwick, uh, which is a Lancastrian symbol. And he stays there. Now, usually he would go to the tower. He doesn't go to the tower until the night before his coronation. So he doesn't actually go to take possession of the tower, possibly because of these connotations. You know, it's it's um, it's uh, where Henry the Sixth died. It's where the princes in the tower went missing. Um, so he, he doesn't do that. So he does go to Westminster. However, he doesn't go there straight away. He goes to Baynard's Castle, which is right near to, it's on the, it's right near to St. Paul's. It would have been, it's not now, it's gone, uh, on the riverbank, which is next to the Great Wardrobe. And the Great Wardrobe is like the biggest theatrical costume set department you can imagine. They are busily <laughs> trying to uh, wipe out the badges of uh so so at Westminster you would have had um the boar of, of Richard the Third, you might have the Sons in Splendor of Edward the Fourth, you might have the the White Rose of York. You've got all these badges in the palaces, the um all the 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 um costs of estate, 
you know, everything is 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 embroidered. So they're busily working to replace everything that has the uh, the badges of the Yorkist faction ready for Henry to move into Westminster. Now, apparently that crown that Richard III had picked up from the jewel tower in Westminster could possibly have been um, the one referred to by Henry as being kept in the the uh, jewel tower, which he built at the Tower of London, which again, no longer exists, unfortunately. Um, what have we got? Lottie Rose, um, <laughs> interesting weighing up. Yeah, thank you. It's okay. I'm just, I like to think of things a bit different. Uh, I'm Team Tudor mainly because that's my little bit of justice for Henry VI and Margaret, although I blame Edward IV for Henry VI murder more than Richard III, which certainly would have been on his orders. Which is why I'm why I'm thinking, you know, Richard's got his literally got his hands dirty for the Yorkist cause. So um is that is that something that drives his behaviour when his older brother dies and he suddenly finds that the kingdom that he has sacrificed so much for is going to pass to a child. I don't know, it's just one way of just, just a question. It's a question. Um, so there you go. That is, I hope you've enjoyed that. The Palace of, uh, sorry. <laughs> well, yes, Palace of Westminster and Whitehall, bit of a history uh, of it. It's it's a potted history, of course. I would definitely recommend Houses of Power by Simon Thurley. Um, so uh, where did I find out all the other stuff from, though? I have to find out. I can't remember. I've known it a while. Um, Lottie, the Yorkist did dirty tactics all the way down the line. And for me, just refreshing that Henry VII did dirty tactics back on them. Yeah, it's dirty tactics all the way. What are we going to do to win? You need to win. Um, you need to win. Of course you do. We are looking at the Rise of the Tudors on the tour. Is a plug next September, September 2024. And I have three spaces left. So if you want to be on that tour, um, check, check out the itinerary and all the details on britishhistorytours.com. And um, if you are interested, if you want to book, then, then go to the bookings page and send in your booking forms and we will get um, we will get that done. Yes, Linda, great refresher prior to the tour. So in two and a half weeks, two and a half weeks, Linda, we are on the Elizabeth I and Mary Queen of Scots tour. So I was very happy to get to go to Westminster, actually having a little um, uh, a little refresher again um, before we go. One of the places we're going is Westminster Abbey uh, because it is, of course, the final resting place of Elizabeth I and Mary Queen of Scots. I'm going to go off on another tangent now. Mary Queen of Scots was actually buried initially at Peterborough Cathedral. We're going to go there on the tour as well. It's where Catherine of Aragon is also buried. Um, but James I decided to move her because she should be in the place of kings and queens. Didn't do a fat lot for her when she was alive, but when she was dead, <laughs> happy to revere. Now, Henry VII does get his, his wish pr pretty much that it's a mausoleum to his family. So it's like a mini church. I'm glad I saw this explained like this. I think it was Emma Wells' explanation uh, in Tudor Places magazine, that it is like a mini church because you have aisles. It's not just one space. You have the, the main space and you have two aisles. In one aisle, you have Elizabeth I, and in the same tomb, but you wouldn't know it, is her half-sister Mary, Mary I. Um, in the other aisle, you have Mary, Queen of Scots, Margaret Beaufort, and... Uh, Margaret Douglas, yes, uh, in the other aisle. In the space where Henry VII and Elizabeth of, the, of York's tomb is, it is it, there's quite a bit of space in front of it. And the conjecture there, um, again, I think this was Emma who said this, is the uh, is that Henry the Henry the Eighth, of course, who would have been responsible for getting Henry the Seventh's chapel completed and his tomb in there um, was earmarking 
the, the other space for himself and his wife, Catherine of Aragon, at that point. So that's very interesting. Edward VI is somewhere um, is somewhere there as well. I say somewhere because it's marked by a 20th century, I can't remember, um, uh, plaque in the floor. He doesn't have a tomb. So... Um, Yes, it was it was it was very interesting. Now Henry the Sixth, Henry the Seventh, excuse me. Do you want to know why he built? Well, I'm going to tell you anyway. Why he built this chapel there? <laughs> so you might think now, well, that's obvious. You've just told us, Philippa, that that Westminster is the seat of power, um, that it has a history going back to 960 AD. That Edward the Confessor was the one who moved the court to Westminster. Uh, he has a shrine there. Why else? Why else wouldn't you know? Why would Henry the Seventh not want to be buried there? Well, he in fact had begun the Tudor mausoleum at St George's Chapel, Windsor, and that was because he wanted to be near, buried near to Henry the Sixth, his kinsman. And a man who he was sure would be canonised by the by the Pope, excuse me. However, um, he wasn't. But also, the monks at Westminster uh, informed. Um, sorry, my comments have stopped going up. If you are, uh, if uh, if oh right, they're starting to work now again. Um, the the monks of Westminster informed Henry that actually Henry the Seventh that Henry VI had wanted to be buried at Westminster Abbey. He wanted to be buried in the same place, and this makes sense, as the shrine, well, Edward the Confessor's shrine. Um, now, when Henry VI died, he was buried initially at Chertsey Abbey. Richard III decided to move his body to St George's Chapel because it was easier to control um, people visiting, basically, you know, become a pilgrimage site. Um, site of pilgrimage, pilgrimage site, yeah. And this is why he was there. This is why um, Henry VII had started his family mausoleum there. So he set up a commission to have a look at these claims by the monks of Westminster, and they ruled that, yes, actually, they were correct. Um, Henry VI had always wanted to be buried uh, at Westminster Abbey. Um and so Henry VII had started these plans based on pre presuming that Henry VI would become our second saintly king. Um, however, that didn't happen. But Henry VII continued with his um, his plans for his chapel, which were completed after he died. Uh, right. Sorry, I'm just going to have a little look at comments um lottie rose yes you had put there it was for when he got henry the sixth canonized which hasn't happened yet um lynn fascinating living thirdly's book oh hi lynn <laughs> just realized because your your handle is different yeah uh living thirdly's book amazing how much he can create from scarce records and masterfully masterfully combines with the tudor history you are yes absolutely so simon thirdly's book um which I haven't got to hand. I really should have done that. Um, he, I don't know I've done that actually. I was using it earlier. He looks at records of, so plans if they existed, or oh, a lot of the times they don't. So he'll look at records, uh, financial records, um, and pieces together really how the Tudor court would work. Um, one of, uh, another interesting thing, uh, this is another tangent, but the, alterations from or the, the the move from the river being the main um kind of transport link to thank you susan for the badge that is very very kind susan has just bought me a badge on instagram i very much appreciate it um when yeah so when so the, the sorry the river was main source of transport for probably for a lot of people, but definitely if you are um, upper class nobility and the, and, and the royal family. Um, however, you did have to be wary or be aware of tide times. You would not be able to travel by river at certain times. 
um, Henry VIII, his astronomical clock at Hampton Court tells him the um, the tide times at Tower of London, I think it is. Um, was it Tower of London? It, it, anyway, it tells him the tide times at, somewhere in, in inland, further into London. Um, Elizabeth I knew of the tides, of course, when she writes her tide letter, so called because she writes it so slowly that because she knows uh, she writes this letter to her sister, Mary the first, when she is being arrested um, after the Wyatt rebellion um, of 1554, she's writing this letter and she's buying time. Basically she knows if she can take long enough to write this letter, they will not be able to take her to the tower. So she must've been at Whitehall. Um, and the reason I say that, and you could look it up. It's just, it's known where she was. I just can't quite remember. Um, yeah, Lottie. So the astronomical clock is at Hampton Court Palace, but the tide, it's showing the tide at somewhere else. And I can't remember if it's the tower or at um, like Westminster Whitehall area. Um, the Tower of London was um, the last uh, point at which the river was relia reliably navigable. navigable. <laughs> oh, reliably navigable. I may have made up that word, but I'm sure you understand what I'm talking about. From the sea. This is why the Romans had settled there. This is why William the Conqueror decided that, yes, this is a great place to, um, to stamp my authority. It means that if trade is coming up the river, uh, it's a great place to intercept for taxes. Uh, so that's the Tower of London. So above that, though, you may or may not be able to travel depending on where the tides are. So it's very, very important. The travel by road is literally a pain in the ass. Um, you've got to, uh, well, if you're an ability, you're not going to be walking. So you're going to be on a horse or you're going to be in a litter or you're going to be in we well, probably won't be in a carriage because they're so uncomfortable. In Mary the first reign, when the ambassadors comes over from, I can't remember, Spain or Italy and has a carriage, brings the carriage with them, um, to which one of her ladies in waiting says, oh, that'd be a lovely present for the queen, wouldn't it? <laughs> Leaves it here. Um, after which uh, the the design is probably pinched, I imagine, and people start making carriages. And in during the reign of Elizabeth I, you start to see carriages being used more. They're quicker uh, than, well, it makes road um, travel quicker. It also affects the, again, this is in Simon Thurley's book, um, it affects the architecture because houses now, they might still have a river entrance um but they're going to have a roadside entrance as well for carriages um they will also need a bigger garage <laughs> a bigger muse where they keep their horses and their carriages so that's that's the sort of thing that um simon thurley's work uncovers um or you know just this yeah, they, these things have an impact. If, if you've got a home, if you've got a house, manor, whatever you want to call it, that's been built, that um, that has uh, an entrance for a carriage, you know it's got to be sort of end of Elizabeth the first reign onwards, probably more likely into the into the Stuart era. So it's fascinating. Anyway, we'll be discussing. Uh, hello, Chelsea over there, in Michigan. Um, so we'll be discussing Simon Thurley's book, Houses of Power, in Book Club on the 17th of September. So I'd love you to join us. If you're not a member of my Patreon already, that is how you can become a member of Book Club as well. Um, it's patreon.com forward slash British history. You also get 10% off, and I'll talk more about this next week. You get 10% off event tickets so we have online history festivals and the next one is on the Tudors we've done the Stuarts we're going to do the Stuarts again by the way we've done the jo we've done the Jordans Jordans <laughs> Georgians it's almost time for me to go can you tell uh, and we're doing the Tudors this autumn so if you're a Patreon a member of my Patreon you get 10% discount on those um 
on those tickets. So, um, so Chelsea, the book after House of Power by Simon Thurley is The Sisters Who Would Be Queen by Leander Delisle, which is another fascinating book, of course. And I am about to announce the long list for the book choices for 2024 as well. So I'll be doing that over the next week or so. Um, Amy says, I'm starting to not like Edward IV, and today you've given me even more reason not to. Edward clearly didn't think uh, what trouble his marrying Elizabeth would cause later on. Yeah, I don't think (laughs) Edward clearly wasn't thinking up here at that point. Um, The Woodvilles could have helped themselves, I think, by not being quite so... Oh, yeah, they're like, they were so, I wouldn't even say power hungry, just, just greedy. They were just greedy. So that, uh, that does not help you win, friends. Everyone, uh, we've been on an hour. So thank you so much for joining. Um, I am back tonight at 8.15pm for History After Dark. It's uh, history dot after dot dark on Instagram and history after dark on YouTube, and we are discussing the Timmy King that is Edward the Sixth. So join us for that. We will be prompt tonight. Technology did let us down a little bit last week, so we were a bit late. But hopefully, we'll be starting on time. We'll be finishing on time, and that is because we have our after show party. Um, so if you're not coming to the after show party, all the tickets are now sold. So look out for the next one. Um, Lottie, I have a very personal beef with him. <laughs> oh, there's a few of them. If we could just get hold of them, tell us. And they would be not interested in what we thought at all. <laughs> there you go. Yes, Edward VI. Very interesting. We'll be talking about him tonight. So if you're not around for that, please join me next week. We'll be doing another History Tea Time chat. Same time. I'm going to keep with this time for a few weeks to test it out. So 3 p.m. UK time. Or I'd like to see you at History After Dark tonight. Or I'd like to see you on my Patreon. All of those things would be very cool. All right, everyone. Have a great day. And I will see you later on or 